welcome to my channel on the best of fantasy. Being a medievalist and a proud nerd, I decided that before seeing the movie The Northman, I would go back and reread the source material, that is to say, Saxo Grammaticus's Gesta Danorum. I have a copy here of the first nine books. These are the the more mythological and legendary books of the 16. The later books are more historical in, in nature. Um, but uh, whatever the case, it is a, a, a fairly well-known work from the Middle Ages, from the early 13th century or so. It was written by Saxo, the grammarian. That is what Saxo Grammaticus means. And it was written in Latin. Uh, it is comparable in some ways to the Heimskringla, which was written by Snorri Sturluson of the Prose Edda fame. Snorri being, in my opinion, the more talented storyteller of the two. Of course, Snorri wrote his accounts in Icelandic. It is worth noting, of course, that the vast majority of tales of Germanic myth and legend that we have t today come from Iceland. But it's nice to have this version of uh, some of these tales from Saxo Grammaticus, from the Danish perspective, if you will. Uh, they do differ in some respects uh, from the accounts given by Snorri and the other Icelandic saga tellers. So it is, it's great to have a different version of events in some cases. So uh, another claim to fame for the uh, Gesta Danorum, and particularly relevant to the Northmen, is the fact that it, is, it contains the ultimate source material for Shakespeare's Hamlet, which is both similar and different to the account that Saxo Grammaticus gives us. Uh, Shakespeare likely or may have read a retelling of, of uh, Saxo's story. He may even have read the, the Latin story told by Saxo. Uh, it's really difficult to tell, and there's been some scholarly debate about which version Shakespeare might have read, but some version or other that was ultimately based on the story that Saxo told, because we really don't have any other version other than what Saxo gives us earlier than that. Uh, although there are lots of tales of young princes who have to feign madness in order to escape their murderous uncles. So it's a, it's a fairly familiar theme. I think you could recognize lots of those stories from various mythologies around the world. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm gonna do, in this video, basically just a uh, sort of this background information and then give you a kind of summary of the tale of Amleth, which is the uh, version of Hamlet or the Northman <laughs> given to us by Saxo Grammaticus. And then I'm gonna go see the Northman, the film, and see what I make of it, what they've done with this source material, how it may differ uh, from Saxo Grammatic Grammaticus' story or uh, what it does, uh, what it adds uh, to it. So I'm excited to do that and I will be discussing this with my good friend A.P. Canavan. So we'll be having a, a film discussion of The Northman. But I thought it would be fun just to have a peek at the original story, the source material, uh, before going to see the film. Uh, so there may be some spoilers. I have no idea because I have not seen the film yet. So be warned if you haven't seen the film. I'm going to be telling you what happens in the story told by Saxo Grammaticus in books three and four of the Gesta Danorum. Uh, and this is the story of Amleth. So fair warning that uh, if you haven't seen the movie The Northman yet, uh, there might be, I, I'm not sure, but I would imagine <laughs> there would be spoilers for the movie, uh, and also, of course, for Hamlet by Shakespeare. If you, if you know Hamlet, you know the basic story as well. Um, so Shakespeare's Hamlet, speaking of which, spoilers for Shakespeare's Hamlet. Uh, it is, of course, one of the greatest works of literature in English uh, and perhaps uh, any language. It is a, a phenomenal, the longest of Shakespeare's plays, a, a, just a, a brilliantly told tragedy that uh, rises to heights well beyond the original tale told by Saxo Grammaticus. Uh, but the premise basically is there the same. It is the in, in Shakespeare's version, King Hamlet, the father, uh, is murdered by his brother, 
Claudius, who marries his brother's widow, Gertrude. And then the play tells about how the prince, Hamlet, the son, must feign madness in, in order to ultimately obtain vengeance upon his uncle. And the, the, the body count at the end of the play is fairly typical of the Elizabethan stage, <laughs> and it includes Hamlet himself. Now, the tale of Amleth from books three and four of Saxo Grammaticus's Gesta Danorum begins with Orvendil. This is the father. And uh, interesting name, actually, because he does have a, a parallel name in Snorri's prose Edda of Orvandil. Uh, and is, this is a character mentioned in a more mythological context uh, who has an encounter with Thor. Uh, and with Thor recounts this uh, while the witch Groa is getting a piece of, uh, <laughs> of a uh, lodestone out of uh, Thor's head. Uh, and it, it also is interesting because there is a parallel name in Old English poetry, Eärendil, which if you're a Tolkien fan, you, you know that name very well. So there's some kind of mythological association of this Orvendil or Eärendil character with the morning star. In any case, this Orvendil fellow is a ruler of Jutland, uh, and he is subject to King Rorik of Denmark, or who is based in Zealand, um, which is considered the center of the of the Danish, um, I guess, political world. Um, in any case, after some piratical adventures. Uh, this character, Orvendel, uh, marries the daughter of King Rorik, uh, Gerutha. And uh, his brother Fengi, that is to say Orvendil's brother Fengi, is jealous, kills Orvendil, and marries Gerutha. So Amleth, the son of Orvendil and uh, Gerutha, feigns madness in order to avoid death at the hands of his uncle, in order to not seem to be a threat. Um, and so he is covered in filth, and he sits by the fire making these strange wooden hooks. Pay attention to the hooks. They will be important. Uh, and this, uh, there, is a, a various, there are various traps that uh, Amla's uncle Fengi sets in order to try to catch him out, to reveal that he's not in fact mad. And one of them is to expose his sanity through a seduction. Uh, but Amleth, he plays the part of a madman, riding his horse backwards, among other things, in order to convince the others that he is in fact quite crazy. Now... Amleth is warned by a loyal friend uh, about this trap, and he also manages to um, have his way with the young woman, who turns out to have been a foster sister of his, uh, without anyone actually knowing. So, <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, he maintains, Amleth maintains his facade of insanity, outwitting his uncle and his uncle's minions repeatedly until Fengi goes or pretends to go on a trip. And on this particular occasion, he uh, has a design to leave Amleth alone with his mother, but with one of Fengi's loyal followers hiding beneath some straw on the floor of the chamber where Amleth is meeting his mother, and this, this loyal follower is listening in uh, for uh, anything traitorous on the part of Amleth or to find out that he's in fact sane. And Amleth... Uh, suspecting the presence of someone beneath the hay, pretends to be a chicken and stomps all over the hay uh, and, of course, uh, finds the man that way, stabs him, cuts him into tiny pieces, and feeds him to the pigs. Uh, <laughs> after doing all this, he confronts his rather distressed mother, uh, reprimanding her for her, dis her disloyalty and also confessing to her his feigned insanity, and his plans to obtain vengeance for his father against his uncle Fengi. Uh, so he does win over his mother. Uh, he, he shames her into uh, bringing back her loyalty to her deceased husband. And uh, so Fengi returns and says to Amleth, where's my friend? Where's my follower, the, the spy in the hay? Uh, Amleth replies, telling him the truth that he's been fed to the pigs, and everybody thinks that Amleth is crazy. Uh, and he does this repeatedly, telling the truth, and everyone thinks he's nuts. Uh, so Fengi decides then to get rid of Amleth by sending him off to Britain, 
where his friend, the King of Britain, is told to dispatch with Amleth. And uh, Fengi sends Amleth away with two of Fengi's loyal followers. And these loyal followers have the instructions uh, to uh, have the King of Britain kill Amleth. Well, Amleth, being ever the clever fellow, discovers this message and alters it. This sounds probably very familiar from uh, the Shakespeare play, but there's, a, there's a, some interesting differences. He alters it, instructing the King of Britain to kill his two companions, but also to request that the King of Britain give his daughter to Amleth in marriage. So he really does make the most of the situation. Now, Amleth impresses the King of Britain with his wits by correctly guessing several secrets at a banquet and ultimately wins the King of Britain's daughter in marriage and also manages to get Wergeld for the two companions of his that he had arranged the deaths of. Uh, so he gets gold for that, which he melts into some hollow rods. And after one year, he returns to Jutland where his own funeral rites are being conducted as he had arranged ahead of time with his mother before departing for Britain. So he shows up at his own funeral as a filthy madman, and he is dismissed, uh, and he shows them these two rods, and when he's asked where his two companions are, he says, here they are, because they are the melted gold from the Wergeld uh, from when he had them killed. And he plays the cupbearer at this banquet, which is full of these disloyal nobles who had basically played along with his uncle Fengi's usurpation of the throne of Jutland. Uh, and so he plays the cupbearer and plies all of these nobles with drinks until they are very drunk and they all fall asleep. And he, using the hooks that he had carved way back when, and a, uh, a tapestry that his mother had woven, he basically captures all of these nobles uh, and burns them alive. Following that, he visits his uncle Fengi in his bedchamber and uh, using a trick, slays him as well. So yay, he gets his vengeance. And following that, he lives, unlike the Hamlet of Shakespeare's play, he lives, uh, at the end of book three, he obtains his vengeance, and then in book four of the uh, Gesta Denorum, he has some more adventures. But these adventures are more or less disjointed and don't add a whole lot to the core story of the vengeance for his father. And ultimately, he does die in battle, giving a less satisfying ending, perhaps, than the Shakespeare play. So there you have it. There is the story of Amleth as recounted by Saxo Grammaticus in the Gesta Danorum. And I am looking forward to seeing what the makers of the film The Northmen have made of this source material. I am most interested in seeing what they do with the themes of vengeance and how perhaps they would go about portraying the madness of Amleth uh, and various other elements, uh, his relationship with his mother, where, what direction they might go with that, and of course, uh, how the whole thing with his uncle plays out. So this should be, uh, I hope, will be a very interesting experience. I'm very much looking forward to seeing what the makers of the film have made of it. I'm hearing the buzz, and I'm hearing that it's a, a pretty well-made film uh, with even some uh, fantastical elements incorporated into it, so that makes me even more keen to see it. And uh, I will let you know what I think when I meet with my buddy AP and we have a chat about the Northmen. Until next time.